So I'm Dan Reyes. I'm the coordinator for the Food Bank of Delaware's Coalition at Hunger. The whole goal is to find new ways to connect low-income communities with local farmers practicing sustainable agriculture in a mutually beneficial relationship. So the food bank was founded in 1981, and at that point there were only 50 member agencies um, that were a part of the food bank serviced by the product that the food bank was moving. At that point it was known as Food Conservers Incorporated. We are now the Food Bank of Delaware. We have just about 500 partner agencies. Um, we've moved as much as 6 million pounds of food in a year. Um, and one out of four Delawareans either receive assistance from us directly or indirectly throughout the course of the year. So, um, this is our warehousing facility. This is where the, this is where and how food moves for those in need in Delaware. So food will come in and it's processed by our operations department. Um, we get food from the USDA TFAP, pro, uh, TFAP program, that's the Commodities Donation Program. So the USDA will buy up food to stabilize prices on the market, and that food then gets donated to food banks throughout the nation. So we get food from them, we get food from supermarkets, we get food from individual donors. Um, occasionally we'll get food from farmers. All of the non-perishable items, which are primarily what food banks distribute, you see up here in the racks. And we do our best to move all of this out as quickly as possible to our uh, 477 partner agencies. Um, sometimes we do it through direct distribution, through our backpack program for kids, our after-school feeding program, um, through our senior program where we deliver senior meal boxes to senior centers. And more recently on the produce end and, and the perishable foods ends our CSA program. Like I said, we'll see that later at the market. So this gives you an idea of how expansive the need is when you see the, what is required in terms of space, in terms of labor, in terms of logistics, just to make sure that people aren't going hungry. It wasn't always the case that poverty was associated with hunger. When people were more connected with their food system, knowing where their food comes from, um, you could have people who are impoverished but not hungry, who still have nutritionally adequate di diets, who still know how to produce food, who know how to access food. You had backyard gardens, you had fruit trees, you had access to farms, you had gleaning. And all of this was very community run when a lot of our population was still largely agricultural. and. Even the urbanized population was only a generation or two off of the farm. People who were more, um, more familiar with agriculture and how to grow food and where food comes from, um, that knowledge has not been passed on. The food system is no longer in the hands of people themselves. It's not in passed down knowledge of how you can subsist and how you can subsist within your community. Control of the food system is is consolidated within distributors and within a few producers and that's largely as a result of the way that the farm bill distributes subsidies so control is taking away from small and mid-sized farmers and through the proliferation of marketing there's this idea there's this idea that um, your subsistence depends on what you buy at the store and what your buying power is so this idea of taking care of yourself through what you grow or taking care of your neighbors through what you grow or that mutual exchange has really deteriorated as local food enterprises and local food systems have disintegrated. Healthy food has been leaving poor communities because there's not a perceived market and because they have at the same time this lack of uh, knowledge, this loss of knowledge regarding how to produce your own food, the combination of the two produces a community that has lost the ability to care for itself and that's true of every of everybody if you took supermarkets away from middle class neighborhoods they would have the exact same problem the way that food is produced distributed consumed and disposed of in this country isn't determined by community needs or environmental needs or or 
what's appropriate for a certain place or what the ecology of a certain place is. It's, it's not determined by environmental factors, human or otherwise. It's determined by policy with a, with a priority for profit. And this starts at D.C. It starts with the Farm Bill. So rather than decisions starting at home being made about what's grown, what the cost of things are, those decisions are made in Washington, D.C. and also on the international level. It's not a bill that has a whole lot to do with developing a food system. A big part of what the Farm Bill is, is layer upon layer of programs that, ha that started in the 30s and many of them haven't been deleted. They just add programs on top because it's, it's reactive and it doesn't actually get to the root of issues. So, for example, we have a fruit cup like this. And this is a, this is a donated product. This was given to us um, by a supermarket or an individual, maybe through our food drives. This is absolutely loaded with high fructose corn syrup, which is a corn product a significant portion of the corn harvest in the United States. Now that corn harvest is covered by both crop insurance payments and commodity payments. So this is an example of something that as a result of agricultural policy is supported by the United States government. Production of this. In terms of nutritional quality, yeah, there's fruit in it, but this is loaded with high fructose corn syrup, which is the detrimental impacts on health, the, the the impact it can have upon those prone to diabetes is enormous. So this is what we're subsidizing. We're not subsidizing fresh fruits and vegetables. If you try your backyard, probably isn't going to have red, not, red dye number two or whatever happens to be in this. Peach out of your backyard is not going to be filled with synthetic sweetener. A peach out of your backyard might, will likely not be a couple years old will not have traveled thousands of miles consuming untold amounts of fossil fuels both in the processing process and in the distribution process. Um, it probably won't have been picked by slave labor in Central America. Uh, a peach in your backyard is going to taste a whole lot better. It's going to have higher nutritional quality um, and you know exactly where it came from. I'd go for the peach in your backyard over that, but unfortunately not a lot of people have that option, especially in urban areas. Not all of the product we get is, is nutritionally inadequate. We get some good stuff. We get veg vegetable soup, things like that. But in comparison to how much better we can do, this is nothing. And you're gonna see later today how much better we can do and how much better we are doing through our community supported agriculture program based out of the Cool Springs Farmers Market in Wilmington. You will see a real life peach being available to people that normally would be receiving those fruit cups. And that's, that's the paradigm that we're trying to shift. We're trying to take that idea of if you're poor, you're gonna get that fruit cup. If you're wealthier, you can get that fresh peach. We need everyone to get that fresh peach and we need no one to have that fruit cup, to be honest. <laughs> so what we do is we pay farmers up front each season for about 70 shares each for the two farmers that we're working with. And in return, we get weekly um, shipments of bulk produce. And we at the food bank, using our volunteer force, sort the produce into half shares and full shares, bring it to the farmer's market where our shareholders that we've recruited through the network of the food bank's food pantries, soup kitchens, etc., show up and pay either five or ten dollars in cash or EBT each week um, to get their weekly shares of produce. And it's whatever came off the field that week. They also get ten dollars, five or ten dollars in, in uh, produce to, and, and tokens to spend at the market. And it's really brought a whole new demographic into the market that otherwise wouldn't have been here. So it's not just about health, it's not just about nutrition, it's both of those things in a community context that's enjoyable. It's a place that you want to bring your family, it's a place that you want to come every week. 
So one of the big barriers that we had to overcome with this was how can we make a program like this that people receiving SNAP and that supplemental nutrition assistance, um, formerly known as food stamps, people receiving SNAP typically don't participate in this sort of this sort of food economy. So how can you make it accessible? So we had to get we had to get waivers from the Department of Health and Social Services. We had to get their okay for that. We had to get our own EBT machine, a mobile machine, so that we could process EBT payments here. Other than that, the hurdles were purely logistical. For too long, we've been providing food that isn't healthy, mostly non-perishables. Just this idea that what we're just doing the best we can, we're just making sure that people don't go hungry. But what we're realizing is that we are in unintentionally sustaining nutritional inequality. We're perpetuating a secondary food system for those who can't participate in the primary food system. What we're doing now is figuring out how we can retool our infrastructure to increase access to fresh produce, to support local farmers. And it's all about figuring out what the needs of producers are and what the needs of the community are and figuring out how you can reconcile those. So all over the country, including the Food Bank of Delaware, you see you see people coming into these organizations and reimagining them entirely and seeing them more as drivers of economic development rather than drivers of charity. How can we empower people? How can we make sure that people have choice and that they're not just going to food pantries and just getting whatever's there? We need to establish choice, we need to establish food knowledge, and we need to establish a relationship between culture, health, and environment. And that's what we're doing here. Our goal is to have not have things sitting up in the racks for, for years or even months, but to get something and move it, to, to make sure that we're not a storage facility, to make sure that we're a warehouse. I mean, we're, we're not looking to grow in terms of how much we distribute. We're looking to grow in the quality and, and the, the way in which we distribute food, and the, or in the way in which we make healthy foods accessible. Where our real growth has been in our programs department, where we're looking for ways that we can improve people's choices, we're looking for ways to affect policy change, we're looking for ways to ensure that people regain that independence and that knowledge of how can I be self-sustaining, how can I help my community be self-sustaining, and how can I keep myself and my family healthy by my own means under my own power. And that's what that's where the where the food bank is heading. We don't want to grow. We don't want to to take in more poundage and distribute more poundage. We want to make sure that people are self-sufficient. So one of the things that we're doing now is our mobile pantry, and we got this great um, out re-outfitted beverage truck. And what we do is we take um, some we take some of our imperishable product, we take some of our fresh produce, and we go to a specific site, people sign up for the mobile pantry. And they show up, they go through an educational class that might be about how to manage a food budget, how to grow a garden, um, how to cook healthy meals, and then they get to go through the line of, of food that has been brought by the mobile pantry, and they choose 50 pounds of food that they want. So they incorporating an element of choice and education. So not just making a distribution, um, really making it an opportunity for people to learn something, for people to choose what they what they want. Another program that we're doing is our SNAP outreach program, and that is where we have representatives both from the Newark branch and the Milford branch going out to communities and helping people register for supplemental nutrition assistance, formerly known as food stamps. So we're working with state agencies to help streamline the process for these people, to make sure that people are getting the benefits that, that they need, to make sure that people are able to retain their buying power with SNAP. Um, and then another major program that we're doing is through our nutrition education department. We have nutritionists that go out and do nutrition classes for both adults and kids and everyone in between um, to show them how to make a small food budget last, how to make healthy foods out of some really basic ingredients. So starting from the youngest of kids, teaching them how to make food and restoring that knowledge that I talked about. Um, 
And then lastly, what you'll see later is our Community Supported Agriculture Program, which now brings in the agricultural community into that picture. Um, and really, in a microchasm, is tying together the food system or attempting to re connect the food system in a whole new way. We're facing so many different issues as, as a community, as a state, as a nation, as a world as a whole. We're facing a plethora of environmental issues, social issues, um, and a lot of times you just get this idea that you need to pick one and you need to focus on that and you need to not care about anything else. But what we're finding more and more is that the divisions between social issues and environmental issues especially are false. They don't exist. The, the idea that what is impoverishing our environment in terms of how we farm and how we subsidize farming and how, and how we treat the soil is inherently related to how people are impoverished both economically and nutritionally because of the way that we've structured our subsidy system because of the way that we treat food as simply a business rather than a way of feeding people and what's incredible about the food the way that food exists in this space here in this commons is that you see it right before your eyes that there is no division between people who care about those different issues. That you have farmers who care about taking care of the earth. You have food banks and youth employment programs that care about taking care of people. And you see that taking care of the earth and taking care of people, all people, are one and the same. If you look around this market and you're looking for a demographic, you can pretty much cover almost every demographic. And that's the beauty of this, that you have everyone coming together for the specific purpose of sharing some time together and sharing some good food together. Obviously it's cool that people with credit cards and debit cards can spend their money here, but I think the coolest thing is that I've seen an increase in the number of people who come here with their EBT cards to buy these tokens. Especially since the beginning of the market we had like a couple people the first couple markets, but now we have regular customers that come to us every week and ask for $15, $20 worth of tokens to spend at the market every single week. It's amazing. I see them every week and they, they want the same thing. They want to get their tokens here. Press a motor in energy, please make the auto matter in history. Can you get the news? Read time and letter to correct it to you. When neighborhood people said we want something in our community that would bring us together, you listen to their ideas. When the food bank said, you know, we really want to work with farmers and help bring fresh food, how, what do they need? And so just keep listening and listening and then how do you make sure that everyone wins and it doesn't matter, you know, if you don't care who gets the credit, you build partnerships. So it, the real partnerships are when people take risks and getting all the partners to take a little bit of risk. So the neighborhood took a risk, um, Food Bank took a little risk, Barclays took a risk, but everybody, everybody's goals were met. And so just listening to what everyone's goals are and then bringing them together into one idea is, is really how partnerships are formed. What you saw earlier at the Food Bank, that is a response to the persistent emergency of hunger. And that is a need that has been growing substantially over the past four decades with the degradation of the nutrition safety net, with the decrease in quality employment, with the disappearance of uh, quality food retail for both urban and rural areas, the disappearance of small and mid-scale farms. And what you see there, where you see the can in the can out, where you see donations coming from individuals, from groups, from supermarkets, from the USDA, that is a model that is serving a purpose in that it keeps people from going hungry and that's absolutely critical. We, have, we are preventing people in Delaware and in the United States in the food banking system as a whole from going hungry. But it's time to move beyond that. It's time to move to actually creating an equitable, accessible and just economy for people who are food insecure and even beyond that for all people. My concern is not just for low-income people to eat healthy foods. I want everyone to eat that way. I want everyone to know where their food is coming from. I want everyone 
to eat ethically in the sense of knowing that it's coming from a place that treats their soil right, treats their workers right. But if you're going to build a new system, if you're going to rebuild the food system as a whole, you have to start with those who have the least. You have to build a system that works for people that have not had access for the system to the system because then everyone else going up the socioeconomic ladder will also have access to it. And that's fundamentally what needs to happen and that's what's happening here at this, at this farmer's market.